Uh, you may remember David last week, David Randall, uh, who preached on Psalm 27, opening with an illustration about his, uh, one of his sons, asking him a, a question at bedtime. Isn't heaven going to be boring, Dad? I'm convinced this is not just a question little children ask. But a lot of grown-up Christians, mature Christians even, wonder if heaven might be rather boring or dull or misty or cloudy or airy-fairy or sitting on a harp and playing, sitting on a harp, sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. Might be a bit painful sitting on a harp. Sit in a cloud and play a harp. <laughs> you may remember that old um, Philadelphia cream cheese advert. Is heaven going to be like that? Do you remember they're in this very white place and the only good thing about heaven seems to be that there's Philadelphia cream cheese on offer. <laughs> and I think that many of us have two problems with heaven. Not a problem with heaven, but a problem with us. First, we don't see how good it is. We don't appreciate from the scriptures how glorious, how wonderful, how real, how solid, how active, how happy it's all going to be. We haven't really taken on board the great statements. That I think there's a lot more about heaven than Christians realize. The Father's house, the, the better country, the, the city built and designed by God himself, the, the new creation, the place where there's no more tears, where there's no more crying or, or mourning or death or mourning or crying or pain. Just beautiful images, maybe symbols, but, but a real reference to something perhaps even better, surely even better than the symbol itself. And they're beautiful and they're meant to make us long for heaven. And we don't generally do we? We don't generally long for heaven. Are you excited about heaven? Are you looking forward to heaven? A lot of Christians I think would say, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I really want to, sounds rather dull to me. The second problem we have with heaven, we have, is that we don't fully believe it's true. I mean I, I mean, I know you do believe it's true, but we don't believe very well that it's true. A lot of our faith is like that. It's in the same category that we find in the Gospels. I believe, help my unbelief. We, we believe, but not perfectly. No one has a perfect faith. And, and this Bible comes to us, this gospel, I think, even through this story to remind us that God's grace, God's promises are not only wonderfully uh, gracious and, 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 uh, and just, just wonderful, just wonderful, but that they are true, that like Jacob, there is solid evidence to back them up. Um, this, kind of, this kind of thing that happened to Jacob, where his spirit is revived, is the kind of thing that happened to the two on the Emmaus Road. You may recall in Luke 24, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, um, an elder here some years ago, died at maybe 20 years ago now, but um, he had a picture of this on, the, on his wall, the Emmaus Road, the two. Do you remember they're walking home from Jerusalem, their faces are downcast, uh, their hearts are very heavy. Uh, Jesus comes alongside, he, he keeps them from recognizing him, importantly, so he can take them through the scriptures, and so that their, their dependence will be going forward on the scriptures, not on seeing him, um, which is a very deep lesson, I think. But uh, as they begin to realize, and it dawns on them that the Messiah had to suffer and then enter his glory, be raised again, that uh, their hearts burn within them and hope is revived in their hearts. And just those words that he speaks to them as he opens their minds bring a wonderful new realization of the gospel. It happens to Jacob in a similar way here. 